Olá meus amigos aventureiros, bem-vindos ao Almas Adventures com Paulo Almas, Paulo Almas e Kevin Almas, dois grandes aventureiros que fazem aqui vídeos já há, um te... há muito tempo, há muito tempo e vamos dar aqui um, um pequeno passeio por pequena Veneza, temos mais de 200 vídeos aqui no canal, em vários países, vários locais, é de perder a conta já, os dedos nem chegam para contar tanto para ir, não é Kevin? Corremos aí tudo, estamos cansadíssimos mas vocês em casa estão a adorar, então vamos lá ver aqui o passeio na pequena Veneza aqui em Londres. Não perco, vai ser emocionante. Acho que bem. Olá meus amigos aventureiros, bem-vindos ao Almas Adventures com Paulo, Alf, uh, Paulo Almas e Kevin Almas, dois grandes aventureiros que fazem aqui vídeos já há, um, até, há muito tempo, há muito tempo e vamos dar aqui um, um pequeno passeio por pequena Veneza, temos mais de 200 vídeos aqui no canal, em vários países, vários locais, é de perder a conta já, os dedos nem chegam para contar tanto para ir, não é Kevin? Corremos aí tudo, estamos cansadíssimos, mas vocês em casa estão a adorar, então vamos lá ver aqui o passeio na pequena Veneza aqui em Londres. Se não perco, vai ser emocionante. Acho que vai incluir macacos e tudo. Ouvi dizer. Mas de manhã está um bocadinho mais. Agora deve estar um bocadinho com frio. Deve estar retido. Mas vamos ver o que é que se passa neste pequeno barco. Alright folks, when you're getting on the boat, if you can go backwards down those steps like a ladder, that is the safest, easiest way. Thank you, that's fine. Bobby, you both. All good. It's fine. Okay. Volta para cá. Já estamos aqui no nosso barco a ver o canal. Esperar que enche, que enche o barco. Aqui para a nossa viagem, né? Que é do Avancio, que está a ver? Água. Água, boa. Muita água. Isto agora vai ser como só. Tem um bocadinho também. Before we get going, there's two fire escapes here, there's two fire escapes in the back, there are several life rings on top of the boat. The best way we can avoid having to use them is if everyone keeps their heads and limbs firmly inside the boat at all times. If we pass another boat, please do not attempt to high-five them. Even if they're waving very enthusiastically, it's not cool and it's not safe. In the tunnel, we have a bit of a crocodile problem, so please avoid dangling anything out of the windows. Gentlemen. And if you could all stay in your seats for most of the trip, It's fine if you want to get up for a moment and take a picture or get a better view or stretch your legs, whatever, just as long as we keep the weight distribution equal so the boat doesn't start rocking. And uh, please note as well, these steps are only to be used when you're getting on and off the boat. So please do not stand or sit on them during the trip. My name's Ruben, I'll be your crew boy. That uh, young chap walking past is Ed, who will be steering our course. This boat that we're on is called Gardenia. It was built in 1947. It used to carry heavy loads of coal all along the Grand Union Canal to Birmingham. Now I'm sure you'll agree it has a much more fun job. When you go to Rome, they of course have the Trevi Fountain. You throw some coins in and you get good luck. In Ireland they have the Blarney Stones. You kiss them and you get the gift of the gab. But here in Camden we have the Magic Watering Can. If you throw some money in at the end of your trip, legend has it, it'll bring you all sorts of good fortune in Little Venice. Awesome. Just going to do a quick head count, don't worry, no one's in trouble, just uh, enjoy the vague school trip nostalgia. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41
Ele estava a dizer que é que este barco antigamente era para despertar carvão. Porque há vários sítios do mundo, há várias fontes e isso cada trazem riqueza, se jogar para lá de dinheiro, não é? Se ele tem aquela caneca que também, se meter lá de dinheiro, também está a boa sorte. É o que ele estava a dizer, senhor. Os clientes estão na parte de cima do barco e não se sentam naquelas escadas. E para tentar manter a distribuição de, de peso uniforme. Ou seja, se vocês podem levantar para tirar uma foto, mas nem levantarem esse barco, este barco pode uh, cabalear. E está ali parte do túnel. Tem um pequeno problema de crocodilos, que dizem eles para não tirar coisas. E tem que passar de barco, não fazer high five, é isso, mas esticar o braço para fora, mesmo que eles façam entusiasticamente. Uh, o cruzamento pode chocar um com o outro, né? os braços. Now, the reason this canal exists is that before motorized engines were invented, businesses needed a way of moving heavy loads of cargo around the city. They basically figured out that if a horse was going along the road, it could only carry two tons, but if instead that horse was dragging stuff all over the water, it could move 50 tons. A boat like this weighs 28 tons, leaving 22 tons for all sorts of cargo. It could be anything ranging from timber, cement, iron, steel, coal, and it would all be stored right where you're sitting. There'd often be a whole family living on one of these boats as well as working on it. The room where we have our motorized engine at the very back is where they have their one bit of living space with a coal stove for warmth and cooking. As a lifestyle, it was about as glamorous as it sounds, but it was a vital part of fueling the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. The horse would be attached to the front of the boat and they'd pull it along by running on the towpath, which is about to be on our right once we've made this slightly awkward turn. As you can maybe imagine, that did cause a bit of an awkward slant towards that side, and so the captain would have to continuously steer the boat outwards to prevent it from scraping against the wall and turning into a jacuzzi. That's the music boat there on that raft. Um, it's quite a popular service. They row you up and down the canal whilst playing you live music and paying no attention to what you're drinking or putting in your cigarettes. <coughs> so you can imagine why it's uh, particularly popular with the people of Camden. Behind that scaffolding that's just uh, up ahead on what is currently our left is Dead Dog's Tunnel. It got its name in the Victorian era when a load of dead bodies washed up in there, mostly the bodies of dogs and it was featured in the James Bond film Spectre. You may recall there's a scene where Bond is cruising up the Thames in a speedboat. He goes under Pimlico Bridge into a tunnel and he somehow ends up in there, which would never happen in real life. It's geographically impossible. <coughs> Camden Lock and Camden Market have actually only been called that since 1974. When this all first opened in 1839, it was Camden Distribution Yard, the biggest in the country, with miles of stable underground that were big enough for 2,500 horses. It's all still there, the uh, underground labyrinth of tunnels. They do guide a tour sometimes, which are pretty fascinating. They're not paying me to say that, it just genuinely is. That white building up ahead is Gilby's house, as in Gilby's Gin. It was the largest gin distillery in the UK, sometimes carrying up to 800,000 gallons of the stuff. It's now a mixture of private flats and the offices of Q and Mojo magazine. The building opposite on the right is the Henson, as in Jim Henson, creator of the Muppets. The top floor was his workshop in the 70s, but the penthouse was sold in 2018 for four and a half million pounds. If you're sensing a bit of a recurring theme here, that's because this is what happens to any interesting building in London. They all get turned into private flats eventually. <coughs> On the right, we see various breeds of the Camden hipster in its natural habitat most commonly found admiring the custom artwork painted by our talented local artists all along the brick walls, and otherwise found smoking herbal cigarettes whilst looking slightly paranoid. Here on the left, we're going to see Pirate Castle, which was set up in 1966 by Lord St. Davis, 
who was becoming quite concerned at how many people kept falling into the canal. They run activities such as canoeing, kayaking, paddleboarding. They even have one that involves yoga on a paddleboard, although that one is not ready for me. I find yoga difficult enough on solid ground, let alone a floating rectangle. They're a very heroic organisation though, they do a lot of charity work, particularly with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. They're good people, we're very good friends with them. You see here on the right there's an indent in the towpath. That's because of the London and Birmingham Railway Bridge, which we're about to go under. It was built in 1834, making it one of the oldest in the UK, and it was an incredibly stressful bridge. If you were unlucky enough to be going under it at the same time a train was going over, then the sound of the train would make your horse panic and then jump into the canal. A horse ramp was later installed to make it easier to retrieve them, and it was back there where I pointed out the indent. Those boats up ahead on the right are what we call continuous cruisers which means on that side they can stay for up to a week free of charge, but if they stay any longer, they incur a daily fee of £150. It's deliberately very expensive, as they don't actually want people to pay it, they want people to go away, so that the congestion is kept under control, and everyone gets a chance to use the space. With the boats on the left though, it's a more unique situation. These ones belong to the people in the houses behind them, and as far as I know, this is the only spot in London that works this way, where if you buy the house, the mooring spot comes with it, and you can keep your boat at the Envy Garden for free. Obviously, when I say free, I mean no extra charge on top of the millions of pounds you'll have already paid. Coming up on the left is a pink house, which underwent two years of renovations, and had three floors dug underground, where they installed a cinema, swimming pool, and gym featured on Grand Designs not too long ago. Although, to be honest, having watched the episode, the main thing I took from it is that it would have probably just been cheaper to buy another house, but uh, rich people have their visions, what can I say? If you look through this white fence coming up on the left, you'll see Daisy, the last domesticated cow in the UK. As you can see, she's not much of a mover. Uh, apologies for the terrible joke. I would tell you another one, but I don't want to milk it. There's quite a few famous homeowners around here. There's Jude Law and Sienna Miller, the actors. There's Kate Moss, the model. There's Russell Brand, I'm sure you know who he is. Noel Fielding, who's famous for the mighty Boosh, now 18 captain on Nevermind the Buzzcocks and co-host of the Great British Bake Off. And David Williams, who's famous for Little Britain and until recently was a judge of Britain's Got Talent. We often see him walking his two little sausage dogs along here. He always gives us a wave and then, an, hello, hello. He seriously always says it like that, but the man's career is built on catchphrases, so what do you expect? Although given recent headlines, I guess it's possible he's secretly bad-mouthing us to someone else, but uh, we'll assume that means it's good news. Right, once we're through this bridge, on the right, you're gonna see St. Mark's Church, which was built in 1857, completely blown to pieces in the Battle of Britain, but then rebuilt and reopened in time for its 100th birthday in 1957. When rebuilding it, they closely followed the original design pretty much to the last brick, so the Gothic aesthetic has been nicely preserved. It has quite a nice outdoor spot. It's theoretically a good spot for a picnic, although these days it mostly gets used by the locals of Camden as a daytime drinking spot, so maybe not. Just beyond it is Primrose Hill itself, which was part of Henry VIII's hunting ground, and other people could hunt there if they had a license, but if they were caught without one, they wouldn't even get a fine. They'd just be thrown straight into a cell. And this horn means we're sinking. <laughs> now it's just Captain Ev warning all the boats in the area that we're coming this way, as we're about to make a bit of a blind turn. Blind for him, that is. We can obviously see out the front just fine. Through here on the left, we're going to see the Feng Shang Princess, a floating Chinese restaurant built in the 80s. 
It's apparently a favourite of Paul McCartney's, and it was featured in the recent Guy Ritchie film, The Gentleman. If it looks suspiciously still and stable in these moving waters, that's because it's not actually floating. It's securely bolted to the bottom of the canal. I've only been there once, and I do recommend it. It's not as expensive as you maybe imagine from it being one of Paul McCartney's favourites. And I have to say, the duck tasted very fresh. And that was the worst joke of the tour. Glad we got it out of the way early on. It can only get better from here. These boats on the left have all removed their engines to make more living space, so they don't move very often. That one at the front up ahead is where has a whole three bedroom flat inside, believe it or not. That block above the boat is where London Zoo have their offices and also some flats. If one of their members of staff comes across an animal who's unwell, they can stay with it for a few nights and monitor it closely. Over the brick wall on the right are some greenhouses, which they use to grow the exotic fruits and vegetables that their animals need, so they don't have to import them. As is maybe becoming obvious, we are now getting close to London Zoo itself. It first opened to the public in 1847, but had already existed for nearly 20 years as a private conservation ground, and then they realised they could make more money by letting people in to see the animals. Most of the animals had been gifted to the Crown by various other countries and nations, and before they were in the zoo, they were kept in the Tower of London, but the only way they could get the animals all the way from the tower to the zoo was to lead them through the streets on a rope. So an elephant was casually strutted through some busy streets. Someone woke up in their central London block, looked out of their bedroom window, and saw a giraffe's face staring back at them. It might seem absurd to imagine, but you've got to remember, it was far more absurd for the people witnessing it at the time, as most of them had never even seen a photo of one of these animals before. The zoo was featured on the 10 o'clock news in October 2016 due to an escape incident involving a western lowland silverback gorilla named Kabuka. He weighed 30 stone, or 190 kilograms. He escaped through some unlocked doors and managed to gain access to a secure keeper's area. Naturally, the whole zoo had to be evacuated and armed police dispatched to the area. When they found Kamuka, he was in a store cupboard, drinking from a five-litre bottle of undiluted Ribena. If you've seen what happens when a child has too much sugar, then you probably don't need me to explain how this began to resemble an Incredible Hulk movie. But with the sugar rush, eventually came a sugar crash, at which point Kambuka looked around, realised his newfound freedom wasn't all as cracked up to be, and willingly took his keeper's arm and allowed him to safely escort him back home. He sadly passed away three years later, which may or may not have been from diabetes, but he lived fast while he could. I'm sure that's how he'd like to be remembered. So the first enclosure that's through this bridge on the right is home to 15 colobus monkeys. It's a fairly new enclosure, the monkeys have only been there since last summer. It's built around Lord Snowden's aviary, which was built in 1965, and was the world's first walk-through aviary, home to hundreds of breeds of exotic birds, until they all escaped and took up residence in Regent's Park. There they are at the back. The enclosure on the left is home to eight African hunting dogs, also known as painted wolves. If we're lucky enough to get a glimpse of them, you'll see exactly why they have that nickname. They are sadly endangered. There's only about 4,000 left in the wild, but eight of them are here. They look very cute and cuddly, but are sadly impossible to domesticate, so I would not recommend trying to adopt one unless you have a massive garden. Mm -hmm. The last enclosure on the left is home to two African warthogs. If you've seen The Lion King, you might be under the impression that warthogs have no worries and they love to sing and dance about it flamboyantly all day long. But I'm sorry to say these two are incredibly shy and we don't see them very often. <coughs> they appreciate having all that greenery to hide behind due to uh, their shyness. I know that because their meerkat friend told me. Alright, the next bridge we go under is not quite in our sights yet, but there's a lot to say about it, so, so I'll get on with it. It's called Macclesfield Bridge, after Lord Macclesfield, who ran the Regent's Park Canal Company. 
but locally it's known as Blow Up Ridge. It became the site of the largest non-wartime explosion in British history. This happened in the early hours of the 2nd of October 1874, when a barge called the Tilbury was carrying a combination of coffee, nuts, gunpowder and petroleum. Now, the crew were unable to give their side of the story, having been burnt to a crisp, so we're never going to know exactly why it exploded, but our best guess is that they either caught a spark or did a match at the wrong time. Whatever the reason, it sent shockwaves all across London. Houses over a mile away had their windows blown out. There was dead fish raining from the sky and whacking people in the face. And a horse guard had to be brought in from St. John's Wood to keep order and protect people from the animals back at the zoo, who were understandably quite stressed out by what they'd just seen and heard. In these days, this canal had about 50 times more boats on it than you see today. About 98% were commercial and 2% were leisurely, whereas these days it's pretty much the other way around. And with the canal blocked up by the debris, the boats couldn't get through, meaning every day businesses were losing more and more money and the economy was tanking further and further. But amazingly, they managed to get it all cleared away in five days. Which would obviously never happen now. Now you just get a sign saying, out of order, closed until September 2023 and then it would reopen around December 2026. As we go onto the bridge, I want you to look at the first and last pillars on the right, and you'll see they have little notches in them. It basically looks like someone's been whacking at them with an axe. These are actually rope marks from the horses that used to pull the boats. The pillars are the one thing that survived the explosion. They're cast iron and therefore pretty much indestructible but they were rotated when the bridge was rebuilt to create a fresh new surface for the ropes. Then once we're through the bridge, immediately to the right, we see a tree with a massive scar from the explosion. In 1874, this tree was just a tiny little sapling, but the scar has grown with it. I think the lesson here is that growth does not always equate to healing, so think hard about how you treat the people in your life. I'm joking. Obviously the lesson is don't expect the council to get anything done quickly unless they have a financially vested interest in doing so. Next we go under Chalbert Bridge, which has a secret pipe running through it carrying the River Tyburn, one of the oldest medieval rivers. It flows from Hampstead through Marylebone to Marble Arch, where there's a plaque for the Tyburn gallows where hangings used to occur. It then turns a course, runs under a building in Mayfair, all the way to Buckingham Palace, and then finally connects to the Thames. It's one of the seven secret rivers of London, of which the River Fleet is the largest. And if you were to climb up and approach Chalbert Bridge at street level, and then bend over and press your ear up to the pipe, you'd look a bit silly. But you would also be able to hear the water gushing through at hundreds of gallons per minute. Here on the left, we're going to see a series of villa mansions, which have all been built in a classical style, but kind of deceptively, as they were all actually constructed between 1988 and 2004, designed by Quinlan Terry, the Dry House prize-winning architect. The massive building on the right here is Grove House, built in 1822, originally for George Greenough, who was a member of Parliament, but it was sold most recently in 1986, to Sultan Qaboos bin Al Sayyid, the Sultan of Oman. As far as we know, he never actually set foot here. He just kept it for nearly 35 years in case he felt like having a massive sleepover and then never bothered. But despite being a bit of a property hoarder, he's actually quite a hero to the people of Oman. In 1970, he helped overthrow his own father, 
who was a tyrannical slave owner, under whose rule there had been nationwide famine and an infant mortality rate around 75%. So when oil was discovered in the grounds of Amman, he kept all the revenue for himself and did nothing to help anyone else out with it. So when Kabus took over as sultan, he improved the health care and education, gave women some long overdue rights, and God gave amnesty to everyone who opposed his father's rule. So all in all, not a bad guy. He passed away three years ago, and he never had any children. He was only married for three years in the 70s to his cousin. As to why it didn't last, the explanation given at the time was that he was just too busy improving his country to have a love life. But in reality, he was secretly gay. And we've heard the National Trust are speaking to his family as they want to buy it back. And hopefully they will. It is, in fact, the third largest private garden in London. The next one on the left is my house. And if we look to our right, we see that the graffiti on that wall suddenly stops and then carries on again a little further up ahead. This is because the family who live in the, ne my neighbors who live in the next villa mansion along, they regularly send out their cleaning staff to paint over the graffiti, but only the bit they can see from their window. <laughs> If you're wondering about the second largest private garden in London, it's uh, just beyond those villa mansions. You can't see it from the canal, but it is quite close by. It's Winfield House, the largest of American embassies, built in the 30s by Barbara Hutton, who was the Woolworths heiress and one of the richest women in the world at the time. She completed work on it in 1936. During World War II, she loaned it to the RAF. And then after the war, she moved back to the States. And in 1949, she sold it to the US government for $1. I realize by telling as many silly jokes as I do, I sometimes lose people's trust, but I try and make it clear when I'm being serious. It really was for one dollar. It was basically a gift, you know, just something to legitimize the transaction. Between 1811 and 1813, this was the site of Thomas Lord's cricket ground. One of his cricket grounds, that is. Um, it was so iconic that it was nicknamed the home of cricket. But then in 1813, he was instructed to relocate it to St. John's Wood. That work was completed the following year, 1814, and he was paid £4,000 for it, which in today's money would add up to a little under 300000 There's a plaque coming up on the left which commemorates it. It's not going to tell you anything that I haven't already told you, but if you're interested, or if you think I'm a liar, it's just past that blue and pink graffiti tag on the wall up ahead. This ledge on the left is often used to store bits of garbage that have been pulled from the canal. But sometimes the objects that get pulled out are a bit too big to fit on there. In the past there have been shopping trolleys, suitcases, entire sofas, washing machines, bicycles, and on one occasion a massive bust statue of Voltaire pulled out of the canal. There was once a dismembered human leg pulled out of there, found by one of our captains. That was a very awkward phone call to the police. There was an IRA weapons cache with Uzis, hand grenades, all sorts of bizarre stuff. We're now entering Listen Grove, a community for liverboard boats. These boats are on a grandfather's lease, most of them are anyway, uh, which allows you to keep your boat moored for 100 years. It costs between 65 and 70,000 pounds, making it one of the cheaper options for living in the Marylebone area. 
And once you've bought it, it's yours to do with as you wish. Your family can inherit it, or you can sell it on to someone else. It's not just tied to one person. There is, however, a very long waiting list. If you get on the waiting list now, you'll maybe get a spot around 2050. Over this red wall on the right is an electricity substation. But in the 1800s, it was the site of a large coal depot. So where we pick, drop you off in Little Venice, if you keep going in the same direction, you get onto the Grand Union Canal, which will eventually take you all the way to Birmingham. That does take about two weeks, but this was a pretty standard journey length back then. And as some of you probably know, there were a lot of coal mines in the north of England back then. So they bring the coal over on a boat fairly similar to this one, except it was obviously horse powered. And the red wall has barely changed in the 200 years since. Those indents that you can see on the wall are there because back then it was also a stable with space for over 250 horses. And if we look to the right, we see that the owners of this green boat really hate their neighbours. Now, um, ever since they got rid of the cricket ground, this has been the widest part of the canal. So the actual reason they're more sideways is to leave enough space for a boat as long as 72 feet to do a complete U-turn when necessary. So they're actually doing us a favour, they don't hate their neighbours, and I'd appreciate it if you would all stop being so judgmental. This building on the right is St. John's Wood Electrical Power Station. It supplies power to basically the whole of North London. It has repeatedly been voted one of the ugliest buildings in London, and I believe they have an open day once a year, if you're that way inclined. Right now we're about 20 minutes walk from Abbey Road, which has some very famous music studios. It's also a great spot for people watching. If you stand right near the zebra crossing just outside, then every 30 seconds you will see another group of people who've had the unique and creative idea of pretending to be the Beatles as they walk across, while their friend takes absolutely ages to snap a picture of them. You don't actually have to go there in person. If you Google Abbey Road webcam, there's a website where you can look through the CCTV camera, and there you will see that I'm not exaggerating, it really is every 30 seconds. It's not quite a road either. Now, in the 60s, the use of the canal declined quite severely, meaning that these towpaths became quite unsafe to use from lack of maintenance. It all started coming back to life when a deal was struck between the local council and the electric companies, whereby the electric companies would pay the council to let them store their cables inside the towpath. This was a super sweet deal for the council. They didn't have to worry about maintaining the towpaths anymore, as the electric companies now had enough incentive to do it themselves, despite also paying money for the privilege. However, it was also a great deal for the electric companies. It saved them from having to dig up the street, and also the water is a natural way of cooling the electrical current, making them both more efficient and less likely to overheat. One of those very rare instances where mixing electricity with water makes things more safe. This boat we're about to pass is Jenny Wren. They're our rivals, so do not wave the them. <laughs> yeah. Only joking, it's all friendly vibes here on the canal. You can give them a wave if you want. Oh, and um, that uh, big ugly blue thing up ahead, that's where the electric cables go from the towpath up to street level. So we're about to be sucked into a massive dark void known as Maida Hill Tunnel. It's 249 metres long and it doesn't have a towpath, meaning the only way you could get through there back in the day would be to lead the horse over the top, then two members of the boat crew would lay a plank of wood along the front of the boat, sit on either end, and then walk their feet along the walls of the tunnel using their leg strength to drag the boat. This process was known as legging and is believed to be the origin of the phrase legging it, although ironically that now means going somewhere quickly. This was of course the complete opposite. You'd also get orphans and poor street children who would offer to help leg through the tunnel. They wrap bits of cloth around their feet to protect them, which earned them the nickname Toe Rags. Do we have any birthdays on board? Any birthdays in the last week or the next week? Any birthdays in the last year? 
Now, I only ask because the echo of the engine, as you can see, is obnoxiously loud at this point, so it's one of the ways we like to drown out this noise, but uh, I guess I'll just keep on talking. As part of the Water Bus package, though, we are able to offer a hyper-realistic and immersive experience that will show you what it was really like to go through this tunnel 200 years ago. Shall we do it, folks? Like so. incredibly obvious to you, it was an absolute nightmare using this canal to transport cargo. There was long dark tunnels that you had to leg through, boats exploding from poorly packed cargo, panicked horses jumping into the water. There were even reports that sometimes people would hear ghosts in these tunnels, although to be honest I reckon that's probably just from the dodgy medicine they had in the 19th century. I've never heard them myself. Anyway, it was uh, as the railway networks grow and the motorways expanded, that most of the businesses started rapidly abandoning the canal, but there were some old school businesses that stubbornly carried on, but they also had to stop in the winter of 1962, as it was so cold that the entire canal was frozen over for two months. And this was pretty much the final nail in the coffin, after which even the most devout traditionalists can no longer deny it just didn't make sense anymore. The modern options have become more efficient and convenient in every conceivable way. Water bus has actually been running since 1958, although the snarky tour guide is a later edition of recent years. But I'm sure back then it would have seemed quite absurd, the idea that one day this canal would primarily be a place associated with leisure. So we have been magically teleported to Maida Vale, also known as Media Vale. The mansion houses you're going to see here go for up to £45 million pounds and are mostly owned by the rich and famous. The actress Joan Collins was born and grew up in the area. Lulu, the singer, has lived around here most of her life and is neighbours with Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones. One road over is a house belonging to Glenn Matlock from the Sex Pistols, another one belonging to Paul Weller from the Jam, and another one belonging to Noel Gallagher, who was of course very famous in the 90s for a Beatles tribute act. His neighbour is Bill Kerbishley, band manager of The Who since the 70s. Speaking of The Who, the actor Phil Daniels also has a house around here. He of course played Jimmy in uh, Quadrophenia, the film based on the Who album of the same name. The Colonnade Hotel is also around here, which is where Alan Turing was born a hundred and eleven years ago. He basically invented the computer, and with one of his first designs, he managed to decrypt the Enigma code which these Nazis and German military had been using to send secret messages to each other in World War II. In doing this, he saved literally millions of lives. Most historians have agreed that the war would have gone on at least two more years, if not for him. And the way the UK government expressed their gratitude was by prosecuting and chemically castrating him for being gay. He took his own life in 1954 by lacing it up with cyanide and biting from it. It's speculated that the Apple logo is meant as a tribute to him, although the designer has denied this, he claims the only reason the Apple has a bite taken from it is so that you can tell it's an Apple. The story is told in greater detail in a film called The Imitation Game. It's available on Netflix, it has Benedict Cumberbatch playing Alan Turing, and I do recommend it, it's a really good film. Even though it just spoiled the ending, it's still definitely worth watching. Coming up on the left is an ivy-covered house, which about 
30 years ago was caught in the middle of a vicious bidding war between Madonna and Barbara Streisand. Naturally, with two fierce divas battling it out, there could only be one winner, and that winner was, of course, Michael Flatley, the star of Riverdance. It was a record-breaking first-time purchase, which set him back £20 million. Prior to that, he'd always stayed either in hotels or at his parents' house. He doesn't own it anymore, though. It's now owned by Sir Bill Kenwright, who's a theatre and film director. Big West End impresario as well. He's back to a lot of the musicals that are on there. And he's also the chairman and director of Everton Football Club! Ooh. Yeah, sometimes when I say that there's a slight boo, occasionally there's a very quiet woo! But it would appear whether people have positive or negative opinions on Everton, the one thing that's consistent is that they're never that strongly held. Couldn't tell you why. On the right there is a cream-coloured boat called Filona, which used to belong to Dave Stewart of the Arithmics. He also once lent it to Bob Dylan for a music video filmed in Camden in the 90s. It was for a song called Blood In My Eyes. Hey, hey, baby, got blood in my eyes for you. It's 90s Bob Dylan, not quite as popular as the earlier stuff, but it's a nice enough little tune. You can see the music video on YouTube. Uh, you won't recognise Felona because you only see the inside of it in the first minute when he rides it into Camden. And then for the rest of the video, you see Camden as it was 30 years ago. Some of it's changed, some of it hasn't. Coming up on the left is a white house with a blue plaque commemorating John Macefield, who lived there in the early 1900s. He was poet laureate for a few years, and he's one of my favourite poets. If you're not familiar, I'd recommend you look up a poem of his called Sea Fever. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of writing. Unlike basically all of his peers, he was not educated at Oxford or Cambridge. He spent most of his formative years at sea, and this is very much reflected in his writing. Well, we're reaching the end now, folks. Once we're through this blue bridge, we'll be out of the Regent's Canal and into Browning's Pool, where we'll be letting you all off. Browning's Pool was named after Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who were also famous poets local to the area. It was also them that gave Little Venice its name, as they said it reminded them of the canals of Venice. I can only assume they've never actually been to Venice. If anything, I get more of a Leamington Spa vibe from this place, but each to their own. There we see Browning's Island, a nice little bird sanctuary. There's several ducks that live there, a couple of cormorants. There's a white goose who lives around there called Lonely. She's basically become the Water Bus mascot. The reason we call her Lonely is that she thinks she's a swan. So she spends her days trying to figure out exactly uh, where her place is in this world. Although we'd love for a lot less if she actually was a swan, as there are actual swans who live here, and they are absolute psychos who maybe just bully the other birds and sometimes the people. I should warn you, it is a protected wildlife ground, which means if any human tries to climb on there, they will be arrested. The last time this happened was just a few years ago, a little after midnight. Some drunk guy was riding a pedalo. He pulled up to the island, tried to climb on. The police showed up and asked him what the hell he was doing, and his response was, The swans understand me. They still arrested him. Well folks, I hope you've had a nice time with us. If you have, please leave us a review on TripAdvisor. My name is Ruben, and Captain Ed has been steering our course. Unless you didn't have a good time, in which case my name is Freya and the captain's name is Andrew. As mentioned, we do have the magic watering can at the front of the boat, but all jokes aside, tips are not expected, you have already paid to be here. If you do decide to leave us a tip, it'll be shared equally between me and Ed, and we always put some aside to buy some bird food for the local wildlife, as they sadly do get neglected, and when they do get fed, it generally tends to be well-meaning but ill-informed people giving them bread which is actually really bad for them. Their digestive systems are not built to handle it, and it can actually make them really ill. So we like to make sure they get something a bit more nutritious. Even the swans were not that spiteful. 
All right, folks, if you could all please stay firmly in your seats, I'll let you know when it's safe to get up, but it could get bumpy and we don't want anyone falling over, so please stay in your seats until I say otherwise. And please remember all your belongings. You honestly would not believe how much lost property we get on here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for riding with London Waterbus. Welcome to Little Venice. We hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. I know it's tempting to do a standing ovation, but we honestly prefer it if you stay seated. We're prioritizing safety over my ego. Just for today. Bar tão bonito, hein? já parece uma casa. Ah, um café, pequena Veneza. Café, water sei, à beira da água. Pequena Veneza, um cafezinho. É sem mais nada para a noite, é que o pessoal vem para aqui. Muito bonito. E quem está aqui volta do GPS. Vamos até agora ao Lidl, daqui da, da zona. Há o Lidl, há o Aldi e o Tesco. São os mais baratos aqui da zona, aqui em Londres. Lidl, Aldi e Tesco. Vou passar aqui a ponte do canal. Há pontes que levantam e a água também que sobe e baixa. Por acaso não tivemos o prazer de escolher nenhuma dessas. Como o senhor estava a dizer, aquela ali é uma ilha. Cá ali os patos e os gansos. E os cisnes. E um cisne. Ah, mas isto não é para tudo lixo. Então, o que é que aconteceu, meu Cameron? Estás a perder o norte? Não, isto diz. Calma. Não, tipo, isto diz que estamos do outro lado, como é que é possível? Não diz nada, estamos do outro lado, estamos de esquerda. Se nós, a gente não está a ver, vamos andar para ali. Ah, é para a frente. Sim. Essas coordenadas, é para essa. Um rapaz jogava Minecraft. Ainda não sei assim, ainda sei onde é que é as minas. Vamos aqui à beira do canal. Aqui um liter, como eles chamam aqui, a caixa de lixo. Aqui com o brasão. City. Mais um London Water Bus. Pequena Veneza. Há aqui vários. Isto no verão, olha lá, talvez os gajos. Bonita caminhada, não é? Jesse. São casas famosas aqui à volta do canal. Olha, teatro de marionetas. É este aqui. Teatro de marionetas. Mais uma ponte. Para onde quer ir? Para a esquerda, acho eu, não é? Para a esquerda, para a esquerda, para o metro. Quer dizer, não, olha, vamos lá. Quer mostrar cá? Então, que é isto? Está já. O que está aqui? Está, está aí uma segunda estrada. Quer dizer, como é que vai dar a merda? Calma, tens de carregar aqui nesta parte. Não. Pronto. Onde é que estamos agora? Estamos ali. Diz que é para ali, vá. Para a esquerda.
Agarramos para o metro e vamos qualquer coisa para a bucha. Isto já são quantas horas? São quantas horas é que são? Ou quase 6 horas para qualquer coisa, vamos para casa para descansar um bocadinho. Amanhã há mais, há mais fandango. Paris, Torre Eiffel, Paulo Lúcio. Bem-vindo à Veneza. Encontramos no Sara. Estamos no Marrocos. De da Serra de Navarre por Londres, por Gibraltar. E na Ilha Terceira, nas Berlengas. 